Welcome to an oral history of the church. I'm Jonathan McCormick. And I'm Adam Christman. An oral history of the church is a conversational history podcast. This first volume is an oral history of the campus relocation of Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary's main campus from Mill Valley, California to Ontario, California. This third episode for this volume is an interview with distinguished professor of New Testament, Dr. Rick Mellick. As with all of the episodes that we do, we want to talk about the significance of this particular one. Dr. Mellick is of uh, particular significance, uh, at least from my perspective. I don't know if you mind me going ahead to to talk about this part. Um, So... Full disclosure, right off the bat, he is my doctoral advisor overseeing my dissertation as I'm working through it, uh, writing it right now. He is, as I mentioned, a distinguished professor of New Testament, which is a, a particular title that is more seldomly granted than if somebody just gets hired at a university or a seminary. It is the highest rank of faculty that we have and one of the highest honors that the seminary can bestow on its faculty, a recognition of a long and important career in whatever their field of study is. Right, yeah. It, I can't think of anything that they could do higher to honor his service to the seminary. Yeah, other than buy him a barbecue dinner. Um, so Dr. Malik is, um, at this point, affiliated faculty with Golden Gate's Academic Graduate Studies program. This means he will come in every other year, or with his contract every year, to teach one course in the program. Uh, Usually he's taught hermeneutics and uh, New Testament Greek Mm -hmm. to our PhD and THM students. Uh, In addition, as an affiliated faculty, he gets to uh, supervise students such as myself, um, as opposed to an adjunct who teaches a course and then uh, is done. He also has that opportunity and uh, burden, Yes. <laughs> in my case, perhaps. In addition, Dr. Mellick was with the seminary for quite a few years. He retired officially as a full-time uh, member of the faculty almost a year ago as of the recording of this uh, episode um, back in the, the summer of 2015 uh, alongside his wife, Dr. Shira Malik, herself an, uh, a registered nurse and an expert in um, education uh, amongst all levels of, uh, of uh, from preschool through adulthood. Mm-hmm. Dr. Malik, uh, Dr. Rick Malik, uh, has served in a variety of roles with the institution both administrative and in teaching roles. So he's had a pretty good experience with what the the seminary does, mm-hmm. both in the classroom and the things that happen, have to happen to make the classroom experience work. That's right. And he, he's taught not only all kinds of different classes here at Mill Valley, but I believe most, if not all, members of the faculty are eventually required to teach courses at one of the other campuses besides the one where they are primarily located. Uh, That was certainly true for him. And he's taught in the online program. Right, exactly. Uh, Which he also continues to do under an adjunct contract. Which is great. Uh, Those those students need him. He's a a brilliant mind in New Testament studies. I I very much value his uh, his supervision of my program, my particular program, Uh, as I try to graduate here. As far as um, the listeners, Jonathan, what what would you point point out for them to, to listen for? Golden Gate Seminary had a PhD program, and it was unable to continue it previously. Schools don't reopen PhD programs. Mm. It PhD programs are expensive to get off the ground and are difficult to get faculty to teach those programs. It's very labor-intensive. 
it's just a hard sell to the the administration and it's a hard sell to get students in i would pay attention to his rather creative means of reinstituting the program yeah i agree i some you mentioned that it's it's just not done or typically not done pretty rare not only did they restart it but restarted it fif- only only 15 years later yeah. or about 15 years or so um, I think that's pretty significant. Um, for me, I would I would give uh, listeners a tip to listen for what it's like to be on the other side of a number of projects in which you've been putting your energy. Yeah. Um, he's been able to 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 initiate, engage in, and complete. Uh, various things uh, being at this point in his career in a way that folks like myself being being on the early end of my career uh, haven't really been able to see yet well, so on that note let's take a minute and listen to Dr. Rick Mallet this is Adam Chrisman and Jonathan McCormick interviewing Dr. Rick Mallet on January 27th, 2016. The interview is taking place in the chapel of Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary at 201 Seminary Drive, Mill Valley, California. So, Dr. Malik, how did you first hear about Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary? Well, being a Southern Baptist, uh, you hear about it. Mm -hmm. You know the six seminaries. Mm -hmm. And though I was in the Southeast for college, uh, and church, my basic church experience, you still know Golden Gate. Uh, not not as intimately or as often heard about as uh, Southern and mm-hmm. Southwestern and those schools. But it was always, uh, people who spoke about it spoke appreciatively. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it's always had a good reputation in my mind. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, how did you first come to study or work here? Well, first, it was to work here, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had been president of Criswell College and decided to resign that for a couple of reasons. And uh, so we did, and really had no place to go. Had several options within three days, but one of those was Bill Cruz, president, called mm-hmm. and said, why don't you come out here? He said, it's a great place to rethink your life uh, where you want to go, what you want to do. It's quiet, and mm-hmm. we're not bothered by a lot of the convention stuff that uh, you find in Texas in particular in those days. And so we came out for a year. And during that year, we had offers to go other places, and my wife and I kept praying through them, and it, the Lord just kept us here. Mm-hmm which sounds negative, it isn't. It's been a very positive experience. In fact, I've enjoyed a lot of it more than any place I've ever been. Mm -hmm. What year was that? that 1996. Uh, How how long did you work here then? Uh, 18 years. 18 years. uh, Full time. Wow. Wow. And uh, when did your wife start teaching for the seminary? She started, in, her employment was in 1996 or 97, okay. and then I think it was probably 99 when she started uh, as faculty full-time. Uh, she developed the Golden Gate Academy and women's ministry things during that, before that time, but those were unpaid. Mm-hmm. Uh, Golden Gate Academy was a paid position, but um, so... She has been here about uh, 14 years or 15 mm. till she retired. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you uh, mentioned a little while ago in the, the other meeting that you were, you're both still teaching for Golden Gate a little bit. We are. She's, she's doing four online courses a year, and I'm doing one a year and then involved in the Ph.D. program, with, mm-hmm. for which I'm very happy. Yeah. And what's involved with the Ph.D. program and you now? Because... Uh, uh, my experience with you, of course, was you were directing the Ph.D. program, um, and you, you started it back up after it had been closed for some time. And, right. Um, so what's involved 
So what's involved at the moment with what you're doing for the PhD program? And then uh, can you tell us what it was like to restart a PhD program? Yes. Well, at the moment, I'm technically an affiliated faculty member. Actually, my contract says a double affiliated, which is kind of interesting, <laughs> uh, which means I'll teach a seminar every year mm. and then supervise Ph.D. students. Mm. So <clears throat> that and advising uh, as needed on the history of what we did and helping the new director as he wishes, mm. uh, going to ETS and representing the seminary there at the Evangelical Theological Society. Mm -hmm. Over the years, 43 years in higher education, you develop a lot of friends. And so that meeting is a very fruitful time for our <laughs> seminary and particularly for the Ph.D. program. Mm -hmm. we, uh, the, the seminary discontinued the Ph.D. program in 1992 before I was here. Mm -hmm. uh, it, had been, it was a good program. It had some difficult aspects to it. And uh, one of them, it was only partially accredited, which was interesting. It was accredited through WASC, but not through ATS yet. Oh. And uh, the faculty voted to discontinue it. I don't know all the reasons. I tried to read and recover some of them. There were some really amazing students who came through, and it was obviously a solid program. Mm -hmm. Some of the students are on our faculty now and, and, of course, doing a very, very fine job. But I, had, I was provost uh, here for four years or so. And when I resigned, um, Dr. Cruz said, well, you need to direct the THM program, which was our highest one at that point. Mm -hmm. And I said, I, I will, but do you mind if I pursue another time at Ph.D.? And he said, no, that's fine. So we began working, thinking of how we could do it with limited resources, uh, limited faculty resources, mm -hmm. no money, <laughs> which was, you know, the seminaries always struggled financially. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so we actually were able to design a program that was completely unique. No one in the country was doing it and mm -hmm. got it accredited, mm -hmm. and it's been received very, very well. We're grateful for, you know, for what the Lord's done through it. Mm -hmm. And is continuing to do and will do with the new director and mm -hmm. the move and all of that. And it officially restarted in 2007, is that right, with the induction of a new group of students? I think seven was the first group of students. Mm -hmm. 2006, five and six, we were working on accrediting. And both agencies, WASC and ATS, uh, approved us at every stage. No, no recommendations or anything other than we had to shape some things a little bit differently. And the idea of hiring faculty who were not resident Golden Gate faculty was a new one that they had to be uh, settled in their minds would actually work, mm -hmm. which is where the affiliated faculty came from. Mm -hmm. uh, I contacted three initially, Dr. David Dockery, Dr. George Guthrie, and Dr. David Howard, mm -hmm. all of whom signed on right away. Uh, but we had to convince them they were really a part of us. So. Mm -hmm. So it's not like they're adjuncts. They actually are receiving a paycheck twice a month. They're, they're Golden Gate employees for the Ph.D. program. Mm -hmm. And then we've added Dr. Phil Long and Dr. Chris Matthews, of course. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, also um, Dr. Chris Morgan now. Sorry, uh, Chris Morgan, not Chris Morgan. Matthews. All right. And then um, <clears throat> yourself now being affiliated faculty and... Uh, Howard and Long. I think that's everybody. Is that right? Is that the whole group? <laughs> it is now. Crew. And we're using adjuncts <laughs> yeah. who would like to have as part of us, but the, sure. the situation just hasn't gelled correctly. Yeah. At least we would have liked to. I think Dr. Wagner still wants them. Um, but Tremper Longman's a regular adjunct, and uh, Fred Sanders looks like he will mm -hmm. be part of it. Freddie Cordoza, both of those last two are from Biola. Mm -hmm. uh, and make a tremendous contribution. Then we've had other professors come in, you know, and teach isolated seminars. Doctor uh, Doctor William Brackney has taught uh, one for us and is returning this uh, this semester to teach on uh, the Radical Reformation. Right. So it looks we looks like we've attracted some pretty good talent. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's, it's, I, I am myself blown away at how significant uh, we've been able to make the program to this point with um, all of the adjunct and affiliated faculty we, we've been able to incorporate and um, the, uh, the graduates are graduating on, on a pretty good schedule usually and um, many of them, uh, uh, you've noted before in previous semesters are getting their dissertations turned into uh, book contracts and then published in other formats and so mm -hmm. on. Um, Michael Peach's book uh, from Peter Lang just, uh, we just received that at the library. Excellent. Yeah, over half, about eight, I think, of our graduates have published their dissertations. Mm -hmm. And one, Steve Hallam, who's the Dean of Education, uh, generally at Alaska Christian College, mm -hmm. has a book coming out, was honored in this spring, uh, a Syriac grammar. Mm -hmm. And after he graduated in New Testament, he wasn't employed uh, in education for a year or two. Mm -hmm. So he said, I think I'll just go learn Syriac. <laughs> and now he's written a grammar on it. You know, like you do. <laughs> you'd, have to know, you'd have to know Steve. He went through the program in two and a half years. Yeah. And very, very uh, supportive of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. We've had, we've really had good students. And I think a good environment, a good ac academic and spiritual and relational environment mm -hmm. that has made the program well received. Mm -hmm. The external readers have also helped. We've tried to pick the best in the field, regardless of their theological uh, convictions. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, it's been the external readers to the dissertations who have recommended publication and helped. And that's been a, a nice thing to see. Yeah. So what are, what are uh, some of your favorite memories of studying or working at Golden Gate in this location here? Well, there are a lot of memories. Of course, you, you, obviously the geographical setting is just spectacular. Mm -hmm. And every day when you come on campus, it, it's fresh and new. Uh, amazing how God's creation just seems to renew itself every day. And, and what a beautiful spot. So one of the highlights is, of course, being able to work in such a beautiful place, minister in such a beautiful place. I think, uh, obviously, one of the highlights for me was to be able to design the Ph.D. program. And, yeah. and I think that uh, I've directed other programs and been in leadership in other institutions. But it was very satisfying to be able to do that for the West Coast. Yeah. One of our rationales was there is no evangelical Ph.D. north of Fuller Seminary all the way to Alaska and all the way east to Kansas City or Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. And so there's a void, uh, there's a voice that was needed, and we were hoping to help become that voice. So mm -hmm. that, was, that was significant. Yeah. Uh, having my wife teach as a professor was also fun. We, we've both been in ministry all our lives, other than she started as an RN and was in critical care, but soon started into Christian uh, grade school as a principal and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. But it was really a nice blessing to be able to serve in the same place mm -hmm. for all these years and know the same students in most cases mm -hmm. and write a textbook together, yeah, which we well received. would never have thought we would do it. <laughs> And that was that was fun. Uh, the students that we met are certainly the highlight, without question. I have I love the faculty. We have great relationships. Uh, they're spiritually minded men and women. Uh, you don't come to Golden Gate unless you're committed to do so, and the Lord brings you here. And I don't mean that in in any way other than. There are obstacles to living in the West and living in Marin County. Mm -hmm. Financial, spiritual, uh, your children face difficulties, you know, as you know, as uh, married men and, and having children. Mm -hmm. But the faculty friendship and companionship is, is strong. It just been, that's been a highlight. But the students obviously uh, keep you alive. And you can name so many that have gone through who are out serving in significant ways. That's not always in significant places as we view it. They're not always in the big churches. 
but so many of our grads are are slugging it out in the trenches doing doing phenomenal things for the Lord and mm. and others have some of the positions that are a little more visible mm-hmm. uh, but having them in the classroom and having such a diversity I think has been helpful mm. what uh what is your most prized achievement you earned while at this campus? And you can take that question however you want. Literally, that I you earned? Yeah, that you earned, you personally. Whether you, that's a literal award or something else that you feel is an achievement. Well, probably, well, I think without question, when the faculty recommended me for distinguished professor, mm-hmm. And the seminary's never had one. We've had the category, and it has to come from faculty mm-hmm. and then through the administration to the board. Mm-hmm. Uh, that that was a long process, actually, a year or more of writing up history and that kind of thing. Since it had never been done, mm-hmm. uh, it, was, uh, it wasn't like saying, hey, we've got this category, let's get you in it. But that affirmation from the faculty really meant a lot to me and, from, and the trustees and the administration. And they've allowed me to keep that title in retirement, mm-hmm. and I value that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so that um, it's not something I earned, I don't think. It's something it's by grace granted to me. Yeah. But it's, it's special to me, very, mm-hmm. very treasured. Yeah, a lot of us were real glad to hear that they had made that choice. Well, thank uh, you. We are real grateful for everything you've done here, and I've uh, valued all of my time in your classrooms and uh, in conversation with you as well. Well, thank um, you. I've enjoyed having both of you in class, multiple classes, <laughs> and uh, and both of you are among the best. <laughs> Hermeneutics was uh, certainly one of the most shaping experiences in the in the program so i i really enjoyed my time in your course yeah thank you jonathan that is true we talk a lot about our dissertations and he his conversation about his topic has shifted significantly as a result of the paper he wrote there that sort of thing it's a good it's a good seminar depending on which students are in there and we've always had a good mix Mm -hmm. but it's so vast a subject you feel like you don't really touch anything well But I hope you're exposed broadly to a lot of things to be able to, to put it into place. A lot of semesters you've had a packed house in hermeneutics. It, and this semester you have four? Four. Yeah, smallest I've ever had. Which would you, do you, I mean, it's only Wednesday of seminar week, so we're very early in the semester, but are you enjoying four? Right now we are. We've met twice. Like or? We've met three times. And so we'll meet once again today. They're good students. Mm-hmm. This one's interesting because I, I observed uh, last night at, at dinner with my wife before the class. I'm the only Anglo in the class, <laughs> and I've had that sort of almost in some other undergrad things, but I've got a, a Filipino whose education was in the Philippines, a Korean raised in New Zealand, a Korean who came to America young, and a Native American. Mm-hmm. And it's an interesting mix. I hope they're not so acculturated to Western culture that they can't make a contribution, you know, in a global sort of sense. Mm-hmm. The The difficulty, the advantage of having 15, which is max, and we've had waiting lists on occasion, is that you get really good discussion potential mm-hmm. because you have so many perspectives, so many different dissertation ideas. And so many backgrounds, and as you probably know, uh, the Ph.D. program is still a majority not Southern Baptist background. Mm -hmm. Originally, it was uh, four out of the first 20, and then eight or so, nine out of the, we got up to 40, we had 10 or 12. And now our own students are qualifying from Golden Gate, and it's it's balancing out, which I'm glad to see. Mm -hmm. And we have Southwestern and southern and southeastern Mm -hmm. and new orleans represented Uh, so the the varied backgrounds make make a big difference in hermeneutics one is one of our grads Mm -hmm. this time Mm -hmm. but having 14 or so 
you're you're getting a broad exposure reading the papers, uh, evaluating them, chatting after class, emailing each other. I think there's a camaraderie that really develops. With, but the disadvantage is all you can do is the papers. I mean, you're pressed to try to get them all in. And and so you feel frustrated that I wish I could spend more time on this, but sorry, we've got to move on. With four, we'll have plenty of time for the papers. Mm -hmm. And I think that will be very helpful. Plus, I have a lot more time. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing a lot more of what I would like to, to impart as a professor in guiding, guiding the subjects. Mm -hmm. Looking back, though, in my Ph.D. work, one of the best seminars I had was an elective on ancient Near Eastern archaeology. It was a Syrian, Babylon, um, a Syrian Babylonian, and, and uh, Egyptian. There were three of us in the seminar. We met in the professor's office with all of his artifacts. And we had to do a paper every three weeks, which was the downsized, but a believable opportunity just to chat with the professor. Mm -hmm. And if we felt like we wanted coffee, we went over to the coffee shop and continued the seminar. <laughs> I'm hoping this will be a good one for, you know, for these, these guys. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, before the announced sale of the Mill Valley campus on April 1st, 2014, what was your impression of the relationship between Golden Gate's Mill Valley campus and our neighbors? Well, I, I had been in administration and I knew some tensions, mm -hmm. but not, but not mainly, uh, not very well expressed. Uh, there were tensions like we, we want to be have access to your campus and you lock the gate on the, on the street or something we can't walk through, or we're concerned a tree's going to fall down, or mm -hmm. every now and then you're a little bit too loud at night or something, you have a party up on the hill, mm -hmm. uh, a worship night or something, and we're hearing music. Those are minor things to have to handle. And ironically, we sold the lots to most of these people who complained, mm -hmm. <laughs> and they should have been, and I think they were glad that we had decided to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, we had some difficulties with them not cleaning up after their dogs or letting dogs run free on campus when they shouldn't have. I remember one of our custodial guys who's been here and done such a great job was walking between the buildings and a dog actually treed him. He went up a tree because the dog was after him. Wow. You, you, those things are kind of nuisances that you sure. put up with. In terms of workforce for the community, everywhere I went, it was employers were just really excited. Mm -hmm. So we felt like we had a, a good place. The people didn't like our ideas or our theology or you know our mission, that kind of thing. But uh, that's Marin. Yeah. So I thought it was all positive until, of course, the master plan to develop it. And the development was what ticked off the people that they could see their house values being devalued. There's uh, more traffic in the infrastructure and a lot of things they were very concerned about. And it got pretty vicious. Mm -hmm. And how did uh, your impression of that relationship change, if at all, after the current president, Dr. Jeff Orge, announced the sale? Well, the relationship changed because the the people didn't want the, the new owners and the new plans. Yeah. And uh, I wasn't on the inside of that, so I don't know all the issues. Mm -hmm. I know he had had some very tough meetings with the public where they were quite vocal about wanting to do what he wanted to do with the property. Mm -hmm. After the sale, it was out of our hands because we're not the owners anymore. Mm -hmm. That's right. And many apparently wanted us to reconsider and stay here, which was nice. They thought we were a better option. I, I don't know how to react to that. I don't know where it is right now. Mm -hmm. um, it sound, it seems to me now. it's like a truce, yeah. and it's settled down, okay, this is the way it is, yeah. and you know, that'll be the future. Mm -hmm. uh, were you uh, 
in any of those? You've already kind of answered this, but were you in on the discussion surrounding the potential sale before it was finalized? Not this one, no. Not this one, no. I didn't think you would be, uh, since you're not on the administrative side, making those kinds of choices. You were very focused on PhD program and, and all of that side. But it is interesting that the campus had basically been for sale for two decades. So we had had interested people. Mm -hmm. Even when I was provost, they were wanting to know if they could buy it. Um, but it, it was just never a possibility. It's amazing in God's timing that once we were completely thwarted by the county and could not develop our property, then we get a cash offer. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, that's just God's providence, I mm -hmm. guess. That's good. And what was your opinion about the sale at that time uh, when it was announced? Uh, I... Because we've already been talking about people who are happy about it, people who are not so happy about it. I'm ambivalent. I was ambivalent about it. Yeah. One thing was the property was such a treasure, mm -hmm. and it was a financial treasure which was devalued once the once the county wouldn't let us develop it. Mm -hmm. But there are not many spots in the U.S. at least that are like this, and. I had hoped we would continue to have it be the Lord's property. Yeah. And and I wish that instead of some of the things we sold or built or allowed to be built, we could have put a Christian uh, conference center or an executive retreat center mm -hmm. and be able to really use this for the kingdom's work all over all over the country. Um, it just financially just wasn't possible. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it was... Unbelievable, unbelievably tight mm -hmm. in terms of operating budget. In terms of more people reaching more students, more accessibility to the campus, a move down south made really good sense. Yeah. I do think it'll change us a lot not being at San Francisco. Mm -hmm. A lot of students came for San Francisco mm -hmm. and some for good reasons, some for more uh, exotic things like wanting to minister to the gangs or the or the mm -hmm. others the you know that you know about in San Francisco and that's all legitimate very few actually were able to do it it's closed closed community yeah. but i think we won't have the same appeal for missions and inner city work where we're going going mm -hmm. to go and that's been one of our strengths mm -hmm. yeah. do you think that uh, they'll be able to to try to um, strengthen that, uh, that inherent weakness of going to a place like Ontario instead of San Francisco by um, building up other locations, like perhaps Brea being a little bit more centrally located in L.A. or uh, this new Fremont campus. Do you think that they, do you think they have the potential to, to shore up those weaknesses where we have been strong here at Mill Valley? I don't think so. No, I think that Fremont here in the Bay Area could mm -hmm. still have the Bay, uh, the San Francisco type, Oakland, San Francisco thrust, mm -hmm. and and in missions and things like that that we became known for. Mm -hmm. We're in Ontario. We're a long way out of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. There are ghetto areas like in San Bernardino. There's some. Uh, well, you, you know, you lived down there. Both of you did. Mm -hmm. But I don't see us from that location taking a 10-minute drive and being in a totally different kind of culture <laughs> like you would have here. Yeah. I do know that Fuller has some really strong outreach. People there have outreach into the L.A. area, mm -hmm. uh, some working with addictive and behavior, some with prostitutes, some with other, and, and they seem to... Mm -hmm. be doing pretty well with that but they're locally closer Pasadena's mm -hmm. much closer do you think it would really help the Bay Area campus if they um, provided some sort of housing like if they bought a, a, an apartment unit that I they think could it rent would to students who could come who want to come from like we've had many students from as you've mentioned for exotic reasons they want they move out here from Kansas or Arkansas or uh, Missouri or what have you to come and enjoy West Coast. 
do you think that would be one way that they could one well, successful way to try and build I that think we up? need a resident facility mm -hmm. uh, uh, Fremont campus will draw fine from San Jose to Tracy to mm -hmm. Fresno it'll be a it, I think it'll be a strong campus frankly mm -hmm. and I think the leadership there will be visionary and that it'll it will be stronger than most seminaries freestanding seminaries mm -hmm. not our Southern Baptist because we're all we're big sure. but the average seminary in the country or the numerically average probably has 150 students or mm -hmm. so I think we'll easily have we could have double or triple that at that campus mm -hmm. um, so maybe there's not a need for a resident facility there but I'm glad that they're buying apartments in Ontario. I think yeah. I think we would not exist well without being able to have people move in and relocate mm -hmm. to the area. And it's hard to live on the economy. Yeah. I mean, yeah. rent an apartment, uh, adjacent apartment, your students have a hard, hard time. Mm -hmm. you, you had mentioned earlier that part of your vision for the PhD program was because there wasn't anything North and uh, West. Um, east. I mean, East. Not sorry. anything West either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's part uh, of our problem. Yeah, we only have 180 anyway. degrees. <laughs> <laughs> Students can only come from half of a, you know, of the diameter or whatever. Right. We'll start teaching the fish. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you think this, the move, will impact the PhD program uh, positively or negatively or both? I think it'll be very, very positive. I think it can be very positive. It will be different from part of the mission I had envisioned, um, but I'm not upset, I'm not concerned about that. The advantage of being there is that there are many more feeder schools within a reasonable drive to campus. So most people don't have to fly in for seminars, for example. And I'm thinking of Talbot and Azusa Pacific's got a good MDiv program, Fuller, of course. Mm -hmm. um, other schools that uh, all of the um, Bethel West and Westminster and, mm -hmm. you know, Escondido down into, into San Diego. Mm -hmm. this, uh, we should be able to draw from those. So I think that will enhance our program. And it'll also make it a little easier to draw from adjunct faculty if we need them Certainly. because there's some outstanding faculty already there. And so I, I'm hopeful and optimistic that it will be a, a real blossoming thing to move down there for the Ph.D. program. And I hope for the MDiv. So I think the opportunity is there. It'll be a little bit different. And by that I mean one of the things I hoped we would eventually do is be able to dialogue with other educators in the Bay Area. Uh, GTU, the academic VP, was very open to me and to us in the accrediting process. Mm -hmm. uh, the, I think he's assistant provost at the University of San Francisco, uh, was very open to us. We're right near San Anselmo. Mm -hmm. We're, we're education rich in the Bay Area. That's true. Except that there's not really a strong evangelical voice. Mm -hmm. And I was hoping that our faculty and our PhD students could somehow be in dialogical relationship, at least occasionally, so we could have more of a presence. And moving out, we're basically leaving the Bay again with no real strong evangelical voice, mm -hmm. and that I'm concerned about. But, you know, overall that's not a big, may never have happened. <clears throat> so it's, it's less than six months now from the move, until the move from Mill Valley to Ontario. Um, has your opinion about the sale changed? You were ambivalent at the time, are you ambivalent now as well? Or if it has changed, uh, what do you think about it? No, and I was I was not ambivalent in terms of knowing we had to do it and mm -hmm. when the sale came. Mm -hmm. It was very clear. It was the option. Yeah, the yeah. only option was to leave. Mm -hmm. And and uh, the way the Lord provided, it was very clear that it was, it was right. Mm -hmm. 
And if we could have stayed, what we would have had to do with our infrastructure, with our campus, it would be millions of dollars we didn't have. I mean, we were on a dead-end street, as I saw it. Mm -hmm. And I think that was correct, and I'm not on the inside of that anymore, like I was. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I was optimistic and positive that this can be a very good move, and I still am. Mm -hmm. Dr. Fermin Whitaker told me several years ago that, and he's the state executive director for Southern Baptist, mm -hmm that half of the population of California, if you, if you draw a line, it's four miles south of I-10, yeah. and we'll be right on I-10. Mm -hmm. Well, you think of all the, the miles of people north of Pasadena and Ontario, we're all up here, and we don't even, we're, we bake up barely half. Yeah. And then from there down, plus you've got Tijuana, Mm -hmm. with millions of people, and a lot of those uh, pastors come over to San Diego and other places to be trained. Mm -hmm. So we'll be moving right to uh, the population area that, and the growth areas that we need to be. And I think that's positive. I think yeah. it's great to have the churches, the intern possibilities. The, the seminary ought to be intimately connected to churches. We have not made that connection here like I think we could or should. Uh, it's just been a different environment. Mm -hmm. Not the seminary's fault. Uh, it just didn't didn't seem to happen in a real vital way on a large scale. I think it can there. Yeah, the pastors down there that I've heard from all seem very excited to have Golden Gate move down. Uh, that they're looking forward to having um, the intern possibilities from students as well as being around. Uh, a, that these are Baptist churches, of course, being around a Baptist seminary, um, closer to the faculty and everything that comes along with being around and in a seminary campus. Yeah, I think all of that will be very positive and will we'll help our training of students, our educating. Mm -hmm. I also think it's going to be really helpful to be as close to Cal Baptist. There will be uh, potential competition, I think, in that if, if they develop master's programs that in any way overlap with what we're trying to do, mm -hmm. obviously there would be choices students would make. But our relationships are very strong with them, mm -hmm. and I think that will enrich us all the way around and give us a greater Baptist and, and evangelical presence yeah. in, in that uh, western L.A. basin or whatever. Mm. Well, we're down to our final question. Um, what do you hope the seminary will prioritize as they make this historic transition? In, in answering that, there are some assumptions that some things will stay the same and get better, and that would be the, the vitality, the spiritual vitality, uh, the mission focus, and, you know, the, the fact that we're here to reach people for Christ— all of those things, sort of the uh, the atmosphere of campus, I hope, will be the same. Mm. Now, it may or may not be with a with a commuter campus. You have to work toward it, but it, but it can be good. Mm -hmm. We would miss having a student housing with. You know, one of the things I've enjoyed is some of the students we have who said, "My dad and mom came here." And I played on these hills, and I remember that tree and riding my bike here, and there's that kind of history. We won't, we won't have that again, mm -hmm. at least for a long time. Yeah. So all of that hopefully remains the same, and that's the question of leadership. Will the administration value it? And I believe they will. Mm -hmm. Now, what is most critical is the development of faculty. <clears throat> and there are two concerns. Um, one is Golden Gate's faculty is a mature faculty. And in the next 10 years, we'll see a lot of retirements. Mm -hmm. And that means that the seminary will change some by new and younger faculty. And the other way, the complementary of that is, we need some faculty who, uh, some at least, who are more energetic in publishing, 
in in doing uh, papers and other things uh, to become a resource for local churches mm -hmm. and a, a little bit more, uh, in some cases, well known in order to draw students and and to draw some away from Talbert and Fuller who ought to be in, in places like that, mm -hmm. who ought to be in a Baptist school. We're going to have to have competing courses and competing resources in some ways. I don't think we can totally rely on the fact that our denomination and its connections will make us a great seminary. Mm -hmm. So my concern is the academic side of it, the cutting edge, uh, grappling with issues, leading the way in terms of contending for the faith mm -hmm. and making it practically able for students to go out well equipped, not only with hands-on kind of ministry, but with heads-on kind of thinking yeah. that in the West we have the ideas. We can, we can, we can really make something happen. Mm -hmm. And I'm anxious for us to maximize that side of it. And for the Ph.D. program, you know, as people retire, it's critical that you get well-publicized, well-known people to lead in a Ph.D. program. Mm -hmm. I think the seminary intends to do that, mm -hmm. but that's one of my biggest concerns. Mm -hmm. All right, well, so you, you feel optimistic then about... The, the move and, and how the leadership will probably take on these these challenges that we've been talking about? Overall optimistic. Yeah. Cautious in some areas. Sure. Because I've been an administrator and I know the tensions and I know the I know that you get caught between this is my ideal, but time is passing and I've gotta have something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you tend to settle mm -hmm. instead of hold out and and the pressures there can be really great. Yeah. But I would like to say that the, the opportunity presented itself, and Dr. Orge has been courageous and exemplary as a leader and bold. Nobody else has done this, really. And the way he's done it, that he's done it, uh, the way he's carried it out, I think is really complimentary. So I'm, I'm very, very impressed and, and pleased with, with what he's doing. Yeah. The other team, too. Gary Groat's done a tremendous yeah. job. Ben and Adam, you know, they're all really working hard. Mike Martin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and even uh, I saw Dr. Durst working real hard already. He is. Yes. Uh, the Fremont campus up and going. The Fremont, which will meet in the formerly Mill Valley campus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For a semester, at least. It'll be a good campus, too, I mm -hmm. think. I think so, too. They're already setting up uh, downstairs in Old Lifeway uh, painting. Going to put in new desks to get their registrar and business people kind of set up and started here oh, in good. the next few months. Very yeah. good. So we're really grateful for you taking the time to talk to us. Um, you are our first interview among what we hope to be many, uh, cataloging the this very significant moment in our seminary's life and um, as as far as I remember only one other uh, move has been so significant for another Baptist seminary and that's been a long time ago now um, so here we are at the ground floor of uh, something significant something big um, and we are again grateful for your time and uh, thank you for everything that you've shared with us well thanks and thanks for doing this I think it's critical and visionary for you for you to do it. <laughs> well, we're we're excited to finally be around uh, something that you can't deny is historic. <laughs> right. <laughs> we might have been around something before and missed it, but we're not going to miss this one. <laughs> yeah, we're not going to miss this one. Good. We see God working now. That was Dr. Rick Mellick, previous director of the Academic Graduate Studies Program, and now affiliated faculty with that program at Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary. Adam, what did you appreciate about our interview with Dr. Malik? Well, as, as you mentioned, uh, the process of restarting the Ph.D. program was very interesting to me. Um, 
but for uh, even more so for my, myself, were his opportunity to look back and see graduates from, uh, you know, his previous schools as well, um, but here at Golden Gate, seeing his Golden Gate graduates as well, moving to uh, successful new positions and enjoying the fruits of their labors here at Golden Gate. He was able to look back and see that the work he did, pouring his his time and energy into the program and into those people, resulted in um, those um, significant and uh, positive outcomes for those people. Um, as I was sitting there that day, I thought that was just the coolest thing to get to see that. You know what I mean? Yeah, he's he finally can see all of the results of the labor he's poured in for these years. Yeah, I mean, we, you and I are in our early thirties. Um, how many how many things have we been able to complete and see the the positive fruits of that labor so far? Not, Not that much. much. Yeah. Um, so that was that was encouraging to me, especially at that time. Um, we we're recording this this conversation a, a couple months later uh, than our uh, actual interview with Dr. Malik. At the time, I was I was just really starting to get my dissertation writing off the ground, and so in an analogous way, I was able to see his the stories he was sharing about his the his his students, the graduates who um, came in under his teaching and were able to move on to something successful. I was able to look at their stories and his own work and see that it paid off. That hard work paid off. He put in the time, they put in the time and the hours, they worked hard, and um, it all finally, in, in their own separate ways, worked out for them. So for me, as I was trying to get my dissertation writing up and going, um, it was very encouraging for me. But what about you? I appreciate Dr. Malik's model and goal of doing Christian apologetics and theology in a way that's biblically faithful mm -hmm. and still loving to the people that you disagree with. Yeah. It seems like we live in a, a time frame where it's there are not many models who are able to respectfully disagree with people who have differing opinions and perspectives or even people who think someone else is wrong and still be able to be respectful in that assertion of error. Yeah. I think Dr. Malik has sought to do that in his career and I appreciate him uh, trying to defend truth in a loving way uh, for Southern Baptists. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, well, it was interesting to get the perspective of um, a faculty member who was not involved with the the discussions regarding the sale of the campus, and who is is able to have an extra step back from the process because he was he knew he was likely to retire anyway mm -hmm. I think um, before all of that went down um, in in actuality so yes the sale occurred before he retired but the seminary didn't move away until well it still hasn't moved away at the time of this recording uh, but he has he's he's moved away to start the next phase of his life and um, so he's able to have that extra layer between him and all of the nitty-gritty issues facing the people who are looking for a new home and uh, signing up and registering their kids with a new school or um, even finding new work. Uh, a lot of students are going down there uh, or students who are moving away somewhere else. This move does change some of the outworking of the vision of the Ph.D. program. Mm -hmm. But I do think he's right that this will, this move will help attract a, a different set of 
uh, prospective students and hopefully more students yeah. to to be part of this program. Yeah, I think it'll be interesting too to see as the the PhD and THM the academic graduate studies program moves on to this new phase of life. What it will be like without residential uh, graduate students, postgraduate students, excuse me. Um, because up until this point, there have been quite a few. Great. Uh, quite a few that lived here on the Mill Valley campus for their education, uh, and also quite a few that commuted. But with this new turn of events and the new campus uh, in Ontario, that will be completely different, or almost completely different. Um, if there are any residential uh, postgraduate students in Ontario, it'll be very few. And it won't look like it does now to PhD students sitting in an office recording uh, an oral <laughs> history project. <laughs> right. We'll be recording it <laughs> over Skype from a Taco Bell bathroom or something like that. <laughs> um, well, uh, did you have anything else you wanted to share about uh, the conversation with Dr. Malik? Uh, any other points you wanted to, to pull out of that? I appreciate his willingness to to take the time and his frankness in the interview. Certainly, yeah. It, it shows a great deal of respect to to us as the students and buy-in in this project. Um, our faculty have really supported the students here in our attempts to apply what we've been trained to do. Yeah, that's true. And so I I really appreciate Dr. Malik being willing to to work with us to to do what he's trained us for. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I pray all the best for uh, Rick and Shira Malik. Uh, if you're listening, uh, I will send you a draft of Chapter Two as soon as I can. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so our next episode, however, is uh, coming in two weeks. It's with Dr. Lisa Hoff, who is currently the Associate Professor of Intercultural Studies here at the Mill Valley Campus, moving down to Ontario with the school. Just a reminder, episodes are released every two weeks with a new interview here on iTunes or YouTube or your podcasting platform. We really would like to hear your feedback, or if you have uh, would like information on our methodology, please listen to our episode zero. It is available now. Episode four will be available May 13th. Once again, that is Dr. Lisa Hoff, Associate Professor of Intercultural Studies. Well, if you've enjoyed this podcast, um, we ask that you subscribe. Uh, please give us a rating on your uh, podcast app of choice. Uh, maybe write a review. Uh, maybe share it with your friends. Every little bit helps to um, give folks a, an inside lateral look at what it is to go through a massive relocation project for a higher education institution. And that's all from us this time, so may God bless you as you go. He's already gone before. <laughs> <laughs>